Hello, welcome to The Eclectic Reader. Listen to great books and stories while you use your eyes and hands for other things. Now here's your host, Madison Mason. Hi, Madison Mason here. I'm so glad you're enjoying The Eclectic Reader. This is chapter 42 of The Gray Quarry Boys. The Gray Quarry Boys, chapter 42, The Conspiracy. Back at the bike, Danny Munson flopped on the hillside. Geez, i got to get out of this fucking sweater. I'm dying. He pulled off the sweater and examined his stomach under the sweaty T-shirt. Hey, Munson, Craven yelled. You finally got a woman on your belly. Look at your gut. Sure enough, there was the vague image of the month's cover girl imprinted in the sweat of his flat white belly. A look of perverse delight took Danny's face. He threw his arms in the air and wiggled his belly in a clumsy approximation of a dancing girl. The guys whined off key. The girls and friends do the hoochie coochie dance. All right, Blackhawks, let's ride. This was the signal playing around was over. They mounted in silence and rode through the woods down to the fields below, jumping holes as they went, solemn and intent. When they reached the edge of the woods, they came to Martin's Road trimmed in rusty barbed wire strung on weathered posts made of split trees. The two-rut border that separated the forest from the fields was a boundary for over a hundred years, cut first by the wagon wheels of the ancients. As they peeled off along the road, Martin's big roan mare came thundering up alongside them on the other side of the fence, her head high, nostrils flaring to identify those creatures with wheels. Her flaming tail flagged the wind like a war banner. She squealed with delight at the chase, and her feet thumped the soft earth, sending signals through the wild boys. This was a challenge they could not decline. Let's go! Todd laughed and ate thighs pedal as hard as they could down the grassy hill, flying past the blurring trees on one side and fence posts on the other. The huge mare burned copper in the bright morning sun, her chest filled with hoarse cries and the thrill of life. She pounded out a heavy tattoo, throwing clumps of chopped loam from her hooves, contempt for their machinery. Down the steep hill they tore, a quarter mile of unobstructed run, the boys gaining speed with the pull of the earth and the horse holding back to stay with them and share the flush of the race. They could see the black road ahead perpendicular to their path and clear in both directions. They knew they had a clean shot to cross it and continue down the hill on the other side. They poured it on until they reached the end of the field and Todd suddenly turned and yelled a loud and powerful no to the mare. She abruptly slackened her speed but still ran straight at the fence where it cut along the highway. She turned only at the very last second, pouring out her heart in full gallop 90 degrees away from them. Her head turned back and she whinnied for the boys as they hit the country road at 40 miles an hour, flat out. The shock of hitting the highway angle was bone jarring and they crossed the thirty feet of graded blacktop in less than a second. Then instantly, all four bikes were airborne. It was a majestic moment of pure suspension. Bicycles hung in the blue morning air like dragonflies, held in a hole of time. The moment a black hawk feels, just before it folds its wings and shoots to earth. The thrill exploding in them was electric, and four boys chorused in the scream of life, echoed away against the wooded hills as they hurtled from view. Cut off, abandoned in a barbed wire world, the mare answered with an echoing cry that begged to be part of it all. And then they were gone. Three turns and two miles later, the friends parked their bikes behind Marv Kyle's milking barn. They squatted in the cool shadow of the thick-walled barn, breathing hard, sweat beating their brows and their eyes wild. When they caught their breath, Benny Morse broke the silence. Let me see those titties again. Danny produced the now tattered playboy and tossed it into the center of the circle. Boys hunkered in serious contemplation as pages were flipped silently. The time for joking was over. A delicious paper woman of platinum beauty gazed languidly into their eyes, her own eyes deep violet and half-lidded, her full ripe lips parted. She beckoned. They ooed quietly from a profound place, conspiratorial and fraternal. The ancient magic of naked female beauty did its work. 
sparking young loins and hearts, calling, beckoning, thrilling, and sending signals to nether parts, stimulating and erecting, weakening knees and setting to boil desires unexperienced, unexpressed, and unfulfilled. Shit, I got a boner, Craven whispered huskily. Todd, Benny asked. All eyes turned and nailed Todd. Todd looked around the circle, reluctant. All right, but remember, it was your dumb idea. The gang rose silent as Indians and scrambled to the corner of the barn where they stopped. Todd peered toward the house. Come on, you guys. The four boys trotted quietly across the white, sunny face of the barn and into the shadow of the huge door where they stopped and peeked out. Slowly, the giant sliding door was pulled shut and all was quiet. Marv's blue pickup pulled up in front of the house and he went inside. Becky was doing laundry. He mashed a kiss on her cheek, patting her ample rump, and she laughed, brushing his hand away. He chomped into a red Macintosh and wiped the juice from his chin with faded blue sleeve. He stepped out of the kitchen and gazed toward the barn. His brow furrowed with curiosity. Four bicycles were parked in the slanted shade under the west eave of the roof. Marv squinted in the light and thought a moment. Not a suspicious man by nature, but something didn't smell right. What were those boys up to? He took big bites of the apple as he ambled down the hill toward the barn. Approaching the door, he knew instinctively something was wrong. He never closed the door when the cows were in the field. He always left it open for them in case of weather. He listened, but he heard nothing. He crept around the side of the barn and rose up slowly until he could just see in the small window. The glass was muddy from the recent rain, and he wiped a pane with his sleeve and peered through. His heavy lined brow tangled in a knot, perplexed. For a moment, he stared in disbelief, stuck between several feelings. Finally, he turned his back to the barn and leaned against the wall. He began laughing silently. He laughed from deep in his being, laughed until tears came to his eyes, laughed the earthy laugh of men who know life from the blood side out, who live with birth, life, and death as a daily cycle. His sensibilities weren't shocked by anything human, unless it was pointedly evil, and this sure as hell was not evil. Marv Kyle gathered himself finally, tears on his cheeks, and chuckling walked to the door of the barn, where he paused a moment to catch his breath. He slapped an angry glare on his countenance and grabbed the handle of the great door, throwing all his bulk against its weight. The big door slid open, flooding the interior with light, and Marv roared with a voice of a vengeful god, What the hell is going on here, dadgummit? It shook the walls. Four heads spun around, snapped four necks, four mouths flew open, and four hearts nearly escaped four chests. Eight eyes slammed open. For a brief moment, there wasn't a breath. The atmosphere in the barn was dead still. Marv's voice echoed down the empty concrete milking stalls. I said, what the hell's going on here, he resounded. Four bitty voices peeped. Nothing? In feeble unison. Silence fell again. Then came the wrath of the angry god once more. Y'all boys get your dadgum dicks out of my dadgum milking machine before I get my dadgum butcher knife and chop them off. And clean that machine good, dadgummit. You hear me? With that, Marv slammed the door, exhibiting uncanny theatrical timing for a countryman. He headed back up the hill toward the house. Halfway up, he was laughing so hard he fell down on the ground and lay there, weak and unable to move. Four hands pulled four tubes off four weenies, and eight guilt-ridden eyes stared in stupefied silence. Finally, Todd went over and turned off the switch to his father's brand-new electric milking machine. He wished he had never told them about it, but now it was too late. He didn't know how he was going to get out of this mess. He was filled with shame. You guys heard my father. Help me clean this machine up now. Not a word was said. The machine was cleaned in abject silence. After it was done, the boys split up and went their separate ways, each to his own interior hell, each in terror of the truth being revealed in his own home. 
Marv Kyle let Todd hang on his own hook for a few hours, and when the time came for the evening milking, Marv put his beefy hand on the boy's shoulder and simply said, Son, between you and me, this is what the machine is for. Understand me? Todd said, Yes, sir. And that was all that was ever said on the matter. But on the odd occasion when he's known to take a drink, rotary picnics and the like, when he's in a corner on the porch with his buddies and their bold red faces and creamy white heads, when they're under the spell of fraternity, loosened with the jugged spirit of the season, Marv Kyle gets big mileage out of the story of those four dumb kids in his barn with their peckers in his brand new shiny stainless steel milking machine on that Saturday morning. And the high point of the story for everyone, always, is when Marv describes the look in those boys' eyes. His face gets red, he can't get his breath for guffawing, and tears run down his cheeks. No matter how many times he's told the story, it never fails to get a laugh. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of The Eclectic Reader. Please go on to the next numbered episode to continue. Also, check us out on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. If you'd like to help support the project, you can donate under Madison Mason at Patreon. And please, check out our website, kltkrdr.com, for more information. Hi, this is Madison Mason. I want to personally thank you for listening to The Eclectic Reader and invite you to share your experience, your thoughts, and your suggestions. We have many great books lined up for the future, but if you have requests for anything that is in the public domain, please email us at kltkrdr at gmail.com. kltkrdr at gmail.com